darkness tries to roll over my bones And sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stay in the chain Hey everyone, so I received a great question lately and it was based around how to study the Bible. It was someone who I had been talking with and saying that if you're serious with your walk with Jesus, if if your walk with Jesus is more than just a walk to the church or to the church parking lot these days and worshiping and sitting and in, in, in a church service, if you want to know that that God is wants to work through you in a greater way than you just attending an event, even though that's mandatory, I think that's a mandatory thing for faith where we're coming together in, in a gathering and hear the word of God. But how does that start to get active? Because Sunday worship is mandatory for the body. We need to be there and we need to hear the word and we need to be with the body of Christ. I've had so many people say, well, how does that get activated then Monday through Saturday? And there's a number of different ways, but the thing I'm going to talk to you about right now is, is probably the, I could give five things. I could, multiple things. I could talk about uh, times of prayer where, where you need to be in deliberate and intentional prayer time where you're carving out time to be with the Lord, with you or a couple other people, but it's not just, th thank you, come Lord, like our kids pray at the, at the, dinner time or breakfast come lord jesus be our guest and let this food to us be breast that's saying a prayer but you're not especially the way they're doing it they're not really 
praying if you catch my drift. So there's a number of things I could I could give to sort of augment that the light, the walk with Jesus outside of our Sunday gathering of the body of Christ as we hear the precious words of God and take the sacrament with each other as we come together. Um, probably the, the number one thing, though, that I would recommend, uh, it would be 1A and 1B, <laughs> would be spending uh, some serious time in the Bible, in the scriptures, and uh, in prayer. So tonight, I'm going to, for people who want to be turned into uh, people who read the Bible with an intentional and serious way, I'm going to show you uh, a practice that I employ and has been very, very fruitful in, in, um, in my walk with the Lord. And so what we're going to do is I'm just going to open it up to a passage, and uh, you need some sort of study Bible to do what we're going to be doing tonight. Now, I happen to have here the NIV study Bible, and what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is verse pooling. And what is verse pooling? Well, I call it verse pooling or Bible surfing, because in the NIV study Bible, as you can see, there's to, in mine, maybe you can't see it, there's a middle section. You see these middle sections right here, right over here and over here. Those middle sections are, are um, that's for, I hope you can see that. These middle sections have letters on them that appear in the text of the Bible and will take you to another passage of scripture that is thematically like the verse you just read or a, or a word in the verse that you just read. And so you literally just start to bounce around scripture. I call it Bible surfing. You literally just, if you want to know what to, about a particular topic, it'll give you eight to ten verses as you surf through this about that about that topic and not just one verse in isolation. So you get a, a great holistic view of, let's say, of the teaching of marriage or the Bible's teaching on sexuality or the Bible's teaching on um on uh, on any 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 topic on grace on love on on Jesus and or the resurrection what what have you the church so I just open it we're, I'm going to show you how to do it tonight and uh, if you if this is for serious serious students of the Bible that want to grow deeply in their faith and in their walk with the Lord and there's no better way to walk with the Lord than to seek his face in his word and to hear his voice when we're gathered together on Sundays and then to see, and to hear his voice as you open up the Holy Scripture, the written word of God. So I happen to open up to Mark 10. And uh, let, let's see, in Mark 10, 13, it says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was he was indignant. And he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So that's Mark 10, 5, 14 that caught my eye. Jesus says, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these children. So the topic kingdom of God uh, belongs to believers or followers of the Lord belongs to believers that are like kids. And what is he saying there? Uh, the, that he's, that they're innocent, that they, they're, they're trusting more to the point. And so therefore there's a, there's a little letter K right next to verse 14, which now I'm going to take my ribbon, see the ribbon here, and I'm going to place my home base back here in Mark 10, if I want to come back to it. And now we're going to surf. There's a little letter next to the kingdom of God belongs to such as these with a K next to it. And it says to go to Matthew 25, 34. So now I'm going to go to Matthew 25, 34. We're going to roll up on this, this section of scripture and see what's said here. Matthew 25, 34. Um, so our topic now is, I wrote down, see at the top, the kingdom of God, Mark 10, 14, belongs to believers that are like kids. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come to me who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. So this is Jesus telling a parable in Mark or Matthew 25, 25, 34. And we hear that the kingdom of God is prepared for us. It's not our creation. It's prepared for us. From the creation of the world that god's kingdom whatever however we're going to start looking at this thing has been prepared for us from the creation of the world it is uh and it's not something that we can we can create on our own the kingdom that has been prepared for you well there's a little r word next to kingdom and there's a whole bunch of verses here which takes us 
to all the way over to Galatians 5, excuse me, James 2, 5. So now we're going to, we're going to roll over and I'm going to put a little mark, I'll put Galatians, uh, James 2, 5, because there's a bunch of verses that, there's James, James 2, 5. Let's read what that says. So now we're going to draw another arrow over to James 2, 5. James 2, 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised for those who love them? That the kingdom, oh, James tells us, that the kingdom is for those that love God. It's not just a, I'm going to go to church and believe in God to get into heaven. No, the kingdom of God, where God's reign is, is for those who love him, are in love with him, who seek his face, who seek his face in worship, in, in church on Sundays, who seek his face in the word, who seek his face in prayer, who long to hear his voice, and who know, know their shepherd's voice, and who know their shepherd as he calls them by name. The kingdom is for those that love, and I underline love. The kingdom is for those that love God. Well, next to that, um, there's a there's a little L. That takes us back to James 1, 12. Yeah, James 1, 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love them. That the kingdom, James 1, 12, God's kingdom is he talks about it, it's a the crown of life that is you will be you'll be given almost a, a royal status having stood the test that the trial and the crown the crown excuse me the crown and the kingdom is going to come through trial it comes through trials it's it's through suffering it's not through uh smooth knees and color, colorless dreams and tamed visions it's god's it's sending out sending us out as sheep amidst the wolves so this is kind of a dead end now. So I, so there's no more letters left. So I'm going to go back to our passage in Matthew 25, 34, which had a couple other spots for us to explore before James. Galatians 5, 21. So now I'm going to draw a line from Matthew 25, 34. So see, I'm building just a pool of verses and just a Bible tree that's going to take us to now Galatians 5, 21. So let's head over to Galatians 5.21. And then this is also, you know what else the benefit of the benefit of verse pooling is, or Bible surfing, is you start to learn how to navigate the scriptures. So the book, the, the really big book starts to get a little smaller. It starts to get a little bit more manageable. So you now you may have to go to the table of content. Now where's that? Now where's that? And where's that? And it may take you longer than it takes me, or maybe you're faster. I mean, the, 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 the goal of the game isn't to be fast. The goal of the game is to be is to be thorough and prayerful. And that's another question I had. I'm going to show you, uh, people have asked, how do you pray? How do you pray? Well, there's all different types of prayer. I'm going to show you a way to pray scripturally, to pray th pray in God's word, th up, up to God's ears. Um, <laughs> now I forgot which verse for Galatians. We we're going to Galatians 5.21. In Galatians 5.21, the Apostle Paul says, now I didn't pre I didn't, I'm doing this on the fly. Like I didn't have any of this prepared. Um, he says, I, I warn you as I did before that the people who do these things, he talks about factions, selfish ambitions, the works of the flesh. He's comparing them with the fruits of the spirit, sexual idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy. I warned you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is those who, those who live for themselves and for their personal pleasure. He's not talking about works righteousness here because literally just three chapters earlier, he says if salvation could be attained by works of the law then Christ died for nothing. He's talking about the fruits of, of the works of the flesh, the acts of the flesh, the mind that has rejected God. You're going to see things pop out. You're going to see impurity, sexual immorality, idolatry, debauchery, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warned you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who live in a posture of unfaith, who live for themselves and for their pleasure, will not inherit. 
So there's a negative verse about the kingdom of God. Negative, or should I say, um, more of a warning. There's no letter after kingdom of God, and that's sort of our study. So now I'm going to pop back over to Matthew. He had some more verses for us. 1 Corinthians 15.50. So now, Matthew 24 has taken us to 1 Corinthians 15.50. Which is one of my favorite chapters in the whole New Testament. And one of the most important, maybe that's a question for another day. I'll talk to some of you about that. One of the most important for New Testament scholarship is 1 Corinthians 15. 15.50 reads like this, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can the perishable inherit the perishable. Uh, I should also say, before you just read one verse, I would, and if we had more time and you were with me, pers- we were doing this on a personal level, I'd take you a couple of verses before the one we're supposed to read and a couple of verses after so you get context. But for, for time's sake, we're not going to do that right now. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. Um, Paul is setting this up to say that when, when, when we go to heaven, he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. And this is later. I I am, I guess I am giving it context now. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed. He's talking about when we're raised into Christ. So when the kingdom come, when we are brought into Christ's kingdom, we are going to be given, uh, what does he say? That the perishable will be clothed with the imperishable and the mortal will be clothed with immortality. The kingdom will be given to us with immortality, imperishability. It's imperishable. It, what does imperishable mean? It will not perish. It will not die. That's God's kingdom. That's good stuff. Okay, back to Matthew. And I'm going to wrap up here pretty soon. But just, so I just want you to feel the rhythm. There's another verse that Matthew takes us to on the word kingdom. Acts 20.32. So let's go to Acts 20.32. Acts 20.32. So i got to write that in. Let's go. Acts 20, 32. What does Paul say? Or this, this is Paul. Yep. Now I commit to you, God, and commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among those, all those who are sanctified. Uh, the kingdom is an inheritance. So what does that mean? It means, and that we've seen that word before in our study just today. That means you're in the family. That you are of his, you are his children. You are the heirs. You have the, you have the inheritance, and he says, and I commit you to the word of his grace, the word, the word of the gospel, which can build you up and give you an inheritance. The word of the gospel builds you up and brings you into the kingdom. Uh, the word of grace, the word of the gospel, brings you into the kingdom of God. That's glorious, man. Okay, let's couple more. Well, I'll try to speed this up. Um, and then Matthew, this passage of Matthew takes us over to Matthew nineteen fourteen. So let's take a look at Matthew nineteen fourteen. And I still haven't gotten back to our original, which was Mark ten fourteen, to see where that's going to send us. I just, I just followed this particular. I say it's surfing because you get on a Bible wave, and who knows where you're going to go. Um, you just you just let it go and you just surf. So Matthew nineteen fourteen. Let's draw another little line here. Matthew nineteen fourteen. And in Matthew nineteen fourteen, we hear Jesus said, "Now we're back to Matthew's version of this. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as belongs to such as these." Um, Don't stop. <laughs> Don't keep the kids from Jesus. Don't keep the k- kids from Jesus' kingdom because it belongs to them. Uh, he, he also lists back in Matthew 25, 34, Matthew 3, 2. So we go back 
Matthew 3, 2. And it's John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness saying, and of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay, that's good. So Matthew 3, 2. Well, it's all good. It's the Bible. <laughs> Matthew 3, 2. The kingdom comes for those who repent. What is repentance? Metanoia is the Greek word. It means to change your mind, to go a different direction. New birth, new life. And Christians should be in a state of constant repentance. Um, let's see if there's any. The kingdom of heaven. Okay, we got a one here from Matthew 3, 2. There's a P. There's a P. It says, um, gosh, now we're going Old Testament. Daniel 2, 44. Let's go to Daniel 2, 34. In Daniel 2... Was it 34? Yes. No. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Daniel 2.44. Okay, that didn't seem right. Okay, here's Daniel 2.44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor it will be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will endure forever. Okay, that's cool. So Matthew 3, 2 took us to Daniel... 244 and what did we learn from the Old Testament here God's kingdom will never be destroyed never destroyed it goes forever it's forever and will crush all other kingdoms he is all powerful there's no rival he has no rival he is all powerful so nothing trumps Jesus' power. Nothing usurps Jesus' power. Nothing is above God's power. He's all-powerful. So when he says to the storm, be still, be quiet, the storm is still and it's quiet. Last one. Matthew 5.3. Isn't this fun? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Oh. So the kingdom can only be seen by those who are poor in spirit. They possess it. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means there's a hunger for Jesus. There's a hunger. There's a knowledge that without him, you'd be nothing, that you need his grace, that you love him, that you seek his face. And those who are poor in spirit like that, God's kingdom will come among them. No matter if they're physically rich, poor, in jail, in distress, sick, dying. The kingdom has come. Okay. Not to mention we get that in the Lord's Prayer. The word the word kingdom is pretty uh, prevalent in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, is it not? <laughs> Your kingdom come. That's Matthew 6.10, which it verse pulls us back to Matthew 3.2, which we've already been. So anyway, if, if you were following along, if you, if you try to do it, maybe you could rewind and start over. You should have something that looks like that. And what I have here is at the top, it says the king, the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God. And then I have all these verses with summations underneath them. And, and then I save these in a notebook. So if I ever, I do this for preaching all the time on a topic or, or on a passage and I just surf it. And you could do this without knowing Greek or Hebrew or any of that. And you just surf and become a serious student of scripture. So look at from today, if someone asks you about the kingdom of God, you could say, it belongs to people who trust and are innocent like children. It, the, only the children, people like kids receive the kingdom of God. And, and we're never to keep our kids from, from Jesus and Jesus' kingdom because he loves them and he took them up in his arms. And this kingdom has been prepared for us. It is not our creation. God has made it. We can't get it ourselves. It's prepared for us even before time. And the kingdom is for those. How do you get there? It's for those who repent. Those who fall on their knees, like the like that woman who cried on Jesus' feet, those who turn away from 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 their wickedness and confess their sin and come to faith in Christ. It's for those who James two five. It's for those who love God. It's for those who uh, desire to seek His face. James one two. It comes through trial. This isn't this isn't just an easy path. The kingdom of God is going to come through trial. Daniel two forty four. It'll never be destroyed. It goes forever. It crushes all other kingdoms. God's kingdom has no rival. It's all powerful. Acts 20, 32, it's an inheritance, which means we're in the family, the word of the gospel, and trusting in that brings us into the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, the kingdom will be given to us. 
and we it, and what we will be given is imperishability that it'll never die that the, the, it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever but a warning galatians 5 21 tells us that those who live for themselves and for their pleasure will not inherit the kingdom of god because they've turned their back on god and matthew 5 3 says for those who are poor in spirit those who are humble those who repent those who know they need jesus knows know know that without jesus there's no good in them they will receive and see the kingdom of God. And so right there, we could have kept going for a couple hours, you guys, and got even a greater picture. But you have a decent little picture on the, on the phrase kingdom of God. And what, how, much, how much time do we just spend together? 10, 15 minutes? So you could do this. You just need a study Bible and you need to take some time. And Bible reading much like prayer, much like anything, is, is, guys, it's a muscle. And the more you exercise that muscle, the more you sort of gain control over it. The more you sort of gain mastery over it. The more you know how to use it. The more you know uh, how, how to control it and how to, how to deploy it in, into work. So you just can't say, well, I just can't do it like, like Dan did it. Or I, I, I don't know. It's like my kid. If it doesn't work within the first five minutes, he just quits. So relationship with God does not work that way. And you're always going to have a shallow relationship if that's how you operate with Bible reading, with prayer, or with church. It's just going to be shallow, shallow, shallow. And therefore, obviously, your influence for the kingdom and God's usefulness through you, not for you, but through you, is going to be severely limited, if not reduced to nothing. Take time in the Word. Bible surf. It's a great resource. We have resources that the, the early Christians didn't have. And do stuff like this. Get a notebook, put it in, and then you can pull it back out. And, oh, yep, 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 yep. And maybe even look them up again if you want to. But you have the summations to remind yourself. Yeah, cool. Yes, amen. And maybe pray as you're going through it. So that's verse pooling. Have any questions? Email me at dshaw at elctacoma.org. I call it Bible surfing because I'm sort of a surfer I used to surf quite a bit and um yeah I actually got quite decent too down in San Diego so let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you that the kingdom of God your kingdom Father belongs to those who are like kids um Father I pray that our church at Emmanuel we would never do anything that would keep the, our kids our children from the kingdom of Jesus as he takes them up into his arms and blesses them Father I pray for those of us who who need to repent tonight and that the kingdom kingdom can come in and among them through repentance. We thank you, Father, that it's been prepared for us, that we didn't create it. We didn't make it. We didn't, we're not the ones that, that birthed it. No, it's you. You have prepared it, Father. And we thank you that, that and we pray, Lord, for a deeper love for you, that your kingdom is for those that love you, that seek your face. So, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, to come into people's lives so that they would have a desire to seek your face. Lord, I pray for all those who are experiencing your kingdom, even though they're under trial right now. Father, we thank you that your kingdom will never be destroyed. It crushes all other kingdoms, especially the kingdom of Satan and evil and the kingdom of death, that it's crushed. You have no rival, that you're all powerful. We thank you, Father, that we're in the family, that we have this inheritance in you. And we thank you for the word of the gospel, which keeps us firm and foundational in you. Father, we pray that we would never be in a place where we would just live for ourselves and for our pleasure and miss your kingdom. And Father, I pray that you would give us a, a spirit of poverty in, in us so that we would constantly feel a need to come to you in prayer and to hear your word and to rejoice in it, to rejoice in the spirit of being poor in spirit, the spirit of poverty, just to have joy knowing that you, you are in us and you and you you, you you live in our hearts and, and we have your spirit within us. And Father, we thank you that this kingdom that is given to us it, it, and we will inherit it with imperishability. That is, we will never die because of the blood of Jesus, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because of the resurrection of Jesus. We have this great imperishability. And so, Father, we commit the rest of this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.